very rainy, miserable day, so it's lovely that you've made the effort to come. I'm proud to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, and on behalf of Vanyal City Council, I acknowledge them as the traditional custodians. I'd also like to pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders, past, present and emerging, and any elders who may be here this evening. Our community is made up of diverse cultures, beliefs, abilities, bodies, sexualities, ages and genders. We are committed to access, equity, participation and rights for everyone. Principles which empower, foster harmony and increase the well-being of an inclusive community. So tonight's forum on transport in Banyul is a very much discussed topic. We're also live streaming this event, so hello and welcome to those tuning in from home. In particular, I'd like to welcome Matthew Bark, Liberal Party member and current Shadow Minister for Transport Infrastructure. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ave Pulielli, the Green State candidate for the North Eastern Metro. And thank you for attending to hear from residents and talk through your approach to transport in Banyul. I'd also like to recognise my councillor colleagues, Deputy Mayor Councillor Alison Champion, Councillor Tom Mallikan, Councillor Peter Costaldo, and from Nillambikshire, Councillor Richard Stockman. Thank you. So transport is one of the biggest issues that our residents talk to me about. And as we return to the office after COVID, there are more people in cars, there are more people on trains, and then there's an increase in demand for better roads, access to public transport and more bike lanes. So it's a great time now to look into the future. So Banyal Council has a number of major transport priorities that it continues to advocate for. As you drive through the area, it's hard not to notice the North East Link is in full construction. So it's a big subject of conversation for our residents. Banyal Council believes a better design option would be for a green lid to be built over the North East Link Tunnel to keep the community connected on both sides of Watsonia. So around the walls tonight, behind you to the sides there are they're comments that we've received from our community. Each speech bubble represents a different comment from different residents. So there are more than 1,500 people that have expressed their support for the green lid. And to date, even more residents are supporting um, council's options. So I urge our speakers and everyone to take the time to read some of these very emotional messages. I'm also very keen to hear from our speakers tonight on what their parties have planned for the North East Link if elected in November. Once constructed, there will be more traffic flowing through Greensboro and Watsonia to access the North East Link. So Council is very keen to hear from all parties what plans they have to manage traffic congestion on connector roads and nearby residential streets. Another priority for Banyul is to have as many people as possible using active transport to commute to work, to education and social activities. So we welcomed the Victorian government's recently released cycling strategy, but we recognise that there are still hundreds of kilometres of missing pathway links in Banyul. We're very keen to connect these corridors so pe people can cycle safely across Banyul and wider Melbourne. In particular, we'd love to see more cycling routes along the railway line as they are safer for commuters, they're safer for families. And on the topic of railway lines, Council is advocating for improved accessibility and safety for all residents at Watsonia and Ivanhoe stations. The street ramp and overhead bridge make both of these stations difficult to access for people with a disability or for people with a pram. I'm very interested to listen to the discussion tonight and learn more about what you are passionate about and what initiatives will be provided 
for our community by the political parties here this evening. So thank you for listening. I'd like to now hand over to the chair of tonight's forum, Denise Francisco, who will begin the formal proceedings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as the Mayor said, my name is Denise Francisco and I'm your chairperson for tonight's event. My role is to ensure that our panellists keep to their allotted time uh, and that you, the audience, uh, keep your questions brief and relevant to transport matters this evening. And welcome to those who are tuning in from home. So um, before I formally introduce tonight's speakers, I'll just like to outline the format and some of the ground rules for how the session will run tonight. Um, firstly, this is a transport forum. So if I could please um, ask people to uh, keep their questions and comments um, to transport related matters. Um, that would be fantastic if you could please focus on transport related matters only. Uh, we'll start the forum um, by each inviting each of our panellists to speak to you for pro probably about six or so minutes. Um, they're going to share their perspectives on local and metropolitan transport issues. We have um, Greg here who's going to be timing our presentations. Um, he <laughs> will issue a, a one minute warning via one sounding of the bell and then on two rings of the bell, the presentation time <laughs> will be up. So uh, that will probably take us to around seven o'clock. Please note the clocks in the room are not correct, but I've got my phone charging behind me, so I'll make sure we keep us to time. But we'll start the um, question and answer part of the evening at that time. Um, I'll ask you all to raise your hand if you have a question. Um, I'll invite uh, individuals to speak one at a time and we'll have some ro roaming mics um, that will be in the room. If I could please ask you to limit your remarks and questions to less than a minute, um, please. And um, I I'd ask that you ask a question rather than making any comments, specific comments. So I would like you to ask a question of our panellists this evening. Um, we'll give each panellist um, a limited time to respond to those questions. Uh, please keep your responses also brief, if you, if you can. Um, and then at about 7.45, we'll ask each of our panellists to provide some closing remarks at the end of the question and answer session. All right, so um, I will just reiterate that this session is being live streamed and it is being recorded and it will be available on the MTF website in the next day or so. So for those that haven't been able to come out tonight on such a horrible evening, people will be able to um, view the recording at a later date. So I'll now um, formally introduce our panellists. Uh, we have Matt Bark, who's the Liberal MLC and candidate for North Eastern Metro. And we have Ave Puglielli, who's the Greens candidate for North Eastern Metropolitan. Um, I will mention that Sonia Terpstra, MLC, had agreed to be the Labor spokesperson but did withdraw last Monday um, and we're unsure of the reason why that's the case. Um, since then, there's been efforts to contact um, other Labor members across Spaniel but none were available to attend this evening. So just to let people know that's the case. Um, so we have flipped a coin and uh, our first speaker this evening is Matt Buck. Thank you, Matt. Take the podium. Thank you very much, Denise. Um, and first and foremost, thank you all for, for coming out. Um, I've done a number of these forums now with Greg. Thank you, Greg, for all the work that, that you do to, to put these on. And they're just such a wonderful opportunity for us to engage with people who um, so oftentimes have a deep knowledge of public transport, in particular in their areas. I want to acknowledge um, Ave. great to be here with you, Ave. Um, the Mayor. Uh, all local councillors. We have at least one other candidate at the state election, Jason McClintock, the Liberal candidate for Eltham, up the back, a passionate advocate for public transport in Eltham. In particular, I don't think I've missed any other candidates for the upcoming uh, election. It's great to follow you, Madam Mayor, and to hear about some of the priorities that, that the council has. And I find myself almost entirely in furious agreement with you. I'm sure tonight 
that the North East Link will dominate some of our discussions. And I think, and the Liberal Party thinks, that the North East Link is a really important project. Um, but uh, there are areas where, in my view, the project has been dreadfully mismanaged. And certainly, I think that we could have achieved a far better outcome already. And certainly, at the end of the day, we will be able to achieve a far better outcome if we, in the parliament, engage far more thoroughly with you and with the thousands and thousands of other residents across Banyul who will be very significantly impacted by the North East Link. So I'm very interested in the Council's plans. Um, uh, I think that um, we should engage in a proper process, even now, even now, to talk far more fully with you, with Council certainly, but with other residents. And so if the Liberal and National parties are elected at next month's election, one of the things we'll do as a matter of the utmost priority is to carry out an urgent independent audit of all major projects over $100 million. Well, the North East Link is well over $100 million, as you know. Uh, it started off costing $5 billion. Well, now it's blown out by more than $10 billion. That's $10,000 million. It's an important project, and I support the project. But I also note the ongoing criticisms that the Independent Auditor General has made about key elements of process that have led to these blowouts. And I'm very concerned about the huge blowouts on major projects. I'm also concerned, as I say, to, to note what I've heard from many people in this room, many others across Banyul, about the way in which the government has moved forward, oftentimes leaving so many of you feeling like your views haven't really been heard. Now, we need to move ahead with the North East Link. It's getting built. It'll get built if the current government is returned. It'll get built if the Liberals and Nationals win the election next month. But there are ways and ways of doing these things, in my view, to seek to get the best outcome for local communities. At the broadest possible level, I'm concerned about the way in which so many transport decisions seem to have been made in recent years. We have some amazing expert bodies in this state several of which, to be fair, have been set up by this Labor government. I think that Infrastructure Victoria is a fantastic body, and those of us in the parliament should listen to Infrastructure Victoria. Infrastructure Australia, also a creation, again, to be fair, of the federal Labor Party, is a fantastic body that oftentimes puts forward wonderful ideas. And yet too often I'm concerned that we hear about major transport plans and major transport infrastructure plans in particular, five minutes before an election without seemingly any proper process and oftentimes without any consultation with impacted communities. That's why I'm committed and the Liberals and Nationals are committed to doing what, again, Labor Premier John Brumby said we should do many years ago, and that is to have an integrated transport plan. It's actually in law that in Victoria we must have an integrated transport plan, but we don't have one right now. That's not just my view, that's what the Auditor General says, but it's really important to do that to deliver the best outcomes for local communities and to ensure that as we continue to invest in necessary infrastructure, well, that's done in, in a reasoned way and in a phased way to get the very best outcomes. Uh, before coming to Parliament just a couple of years ago, I was a school teacher in Ivanhoe. And um, my wife and I only ran one car at the time. Um, principally, that was a cost-saving measure, um, not necessarily a, a green measure, Ave, but nonetheless, we were pleased that we were able to do that. But we were only really able to do that because of some really good bike paths between my home in Kew and, and Ivanhoe. So I hear the Mayor and I agree with her that whilst there are some really good paths already, some really good tracks already, if we could do better there, well, we can encourage more people to mode shift um, it was great for, for my health and my mental health, to tell you the truth, to always start my day with a run or a walk or a bike ride. Well, I can't do that anymore, principally because that infrastructure isn't there. So if I get the opportunity as Minister for Transport Infrastructure after this election, I'd love to work with you and the council and local residents to seek to deliver in that really important area as well. I can't wait to take your questions and thank you so much for welcoming me tonight. Thank you, Ave. I'll get you to take the podium uh, for your six minutes. Thank you. Terrific. Welcome. Uh, hi, I'm Ave. 
thanks everyone for coming along tonight. Uh, as you know, I'm the lead candidate for the Greens in North East Metro for the Upper House, a seat we held up until 2018. Uh, I'd like to start also by acknowledging the country that we're on tonight, the lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, acknowledging that this is stolen land, sovereignty was never ceded, and in the Victorian Greens we are committed to working with First Nations people towards truth-telling, treaty and voice. On the topic of First Nations culture in this place, uh, it's important that we do acknowledge and we talk about transport tonight. We're talking about traversing across country that First Nations people have themselves travelled across for literally tens of thousands of years. And I think when we talk about rolling out really immense projects as we've been talking about, we are, I think it's in incumbent on us to acknowledge that we're doing that on land that was here before we settled it. Uh, that it's on us to think about uh, the things that First Nations people have treasured here for tens of thousands of years, the environment, uh, our vegetation, flora and fauna, and factor that in when we are talking about delivery of new projects. And I think when we look at projects like the North East Link currently, we see just how far off track we have gone in that vein. Uh, and while it is a political reality that the project is going to get delivered in some form, at the Victorian Greens we do commit to pushing further on making sure that we are preserving what we can, that we are opting into projects that we can to ensure that it does minimal damage as possible to the environment, to the community. It is really both ecological and economic vandalism at this point. But we'll come back to that topic, I'm sure, later. Uh, the Victorian Greens going into this election, effectively our view, as many of you would know, is for public transport, for more sustainable, greener options of getting from A to B. Uh, effectively, it comes under three pillars, which I'll go through now. The first one being looking at our existing public transport uh, infrastructure that we've got, like the Hurstbridge line really close to us, and getting absolute the most bang for buck that we can out of that. Improving both access to those services for community and residents, but also getting an improvement in frequency and cost to those things. So we have in the recent weeks already announced going into this um, election campaign that we're looking at turning, say, the Hurstbridge Line's frequency of trains from being what is off-peak around, say, 20 to 30 minutes, or if you're looking into the evening, much longer, towards a seven to seven, 10 minute frequency of the trains so that you can actually have some security in knowing that when you want to get from A to B, the train is going to be there, making it a more enticing option for commuters. We know if we can make um, more sustainable transport a more viable, enticing option, people will choose to take it. Currently, when that is not the case, that is why people then take a fossil fuel powered car. Uh, and it's important to think about that because we know that transport in this state is quickly becoming the most uh, high emitting sector. And so we know that that trend is only going to continue unless we do truly address it. Which then brings me to my second sort of pillar for our policies that I'm announcing, um, uh, which is around the electric vehicles, the uptake in the area, but also access. So that comes down to firstly, uh, there's an eco bonus that we've talked about in the Greens in recent weeks of up to $15,000 to enable fossil fuel car owners to transition in a more affordable way to having access to an electric vehicle. It's also to roll out thousands more uh, charging stations across the state to make sure that there is some security to the minds of those that are buying an electric vehicle, that there is a place that you can charge it if you don't have a home charging capacity. But also in much more recent weeks, talking about this idea of a solar powered car. It's a relatively new technology that's being used elsewhere in the world, but effectively the idea is that you're treating your car like a battery powered by renewable energy from the sun, and it has a two-way transfer between the home and the car that you drive to work or to, to getting the shopping every day. Uh, so it's a, a lot to think about in terms of electric vehicles. I don't know if we can improve cost and access and immediate amenity in the use of an electric vehicle, people will choose to make that transition. And it's important that we look at every factor when we're trying to talk about um, improving transport access and its effect on climate, that we do all of the things that we can to make it better. Uh, that, that brings me then to the sort of third pillar, which is around these ideas of active transport of, uh, we talked about trails, cycling, walking, ways of getting from A to B that don't rely on a fossil fuel powered vehicle. Uh, so the Greens have already detailed that there is a fund, which like all of the other um, policy points that I've outlined are to be um, funded by increased levy on big banks, on gambling industry, and on property, property developers. 
to make sure that they're paying their fair share so we can get these services rolled out. Um, it means that then we can actually have a, a genuine community consultation around this idea of, oh, do you need a pedestrian crossing here? Let's have a conversation about that. And not having the impact of cost deterring these decisions being made, knowing that we are able to then invest in our communities, um, making sure that we are redirecting those funds from those other industries to something that delivers for the community. Uh, I'm sure we're gonna have lots of great questions tonight, but I think I'm gonna leave my comments there for now. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Matt and Ave, for delivering your perspectives on local and metropolitan transport. We're now moving to the Q&A part of the evening. Can I just ask, are there any of the independent candidates here this evening? We'll just um, invite them to let us know if they are in the room. No? Okay, no worries. All right, so we do want to get through as many questions as we can. So I'll ask you to get straight to your question. Um, if you have one, please raise your hand. We've got one here, then here, then here. Um, I'll be spreading the questions throughout the room and we've got a couple of roving, roving, roving mics. I'll come over here first. The first question, Sorry, I'll just get you to wait. and will give you the I'm microphone. Sorry. So sorry. just so other people can hear your question. Thank you very much. <coughs> Uh, the, the question I'm concerned about, I've worked in disability for many years, but I am worried about all the bicycle paths being used by uh, backyard road scooters. Um, I feel that along the bicycle paths, no one leaves their bike lying around being a bicycle person. No one leaves their runners lying around being a runner. But I find on the bicycle paths and the hoof paths, all these scooters being left there. I would like to see that... Can that I ask you to... I would, like to ask, question. I would like to ask that whoever's elected or has an opinion on banning the leaving the scooters on these bicycles and running paths. Thank you for your, the question. They, they ban it. Thank you. The question you. there is about whether or not are there, you would be wanting to ban um, the parking of the scooters on the paths. Who'd like to take that first? I'm very happy to. Uh, so, thank you. Sorry, sir, what's your name? Uh, Danny Johnson. Danny. You, I spoke to you recently about some All right, great, great. Thank, thank you, Danny. Um, and I hear you. Um, I think where I live too, it's, I, I've noted that while scooters can be a good option for, for some people to do some of the things that Dave was talking about a little bit before, um, maybe it's just the fact that we're all used to riding our push bikes. So we're a bit better trained and a bit better behaved when it comes to their storage. So maybe there's an education piece there. But if there's a need, surely government can be clearer with people, especially for folks with disabilities, like you said, that that is not on and not something that should be done. Um, I, I hope there are more questions about access for folks with disabilities, actually, because I think there are some significant issues in Banyul and across the state when it comes to making sure, especially that our public transport system is as accessible as it, as it can be. Thank you, Matt. Ave. Yeah, in a similar vein, um, while it is great that we do have these other modes of getting out and about, it is always important that we do have the appropriate regulation in place to ensure that, as has been pointed out, there is accessibility to the paths and um, for a community safety concern that we aren't having them left lying around. I know that is a conversation that's being had currently across the state in, in parts of town where you've got, say, the electric scooters going around. It is something we do need to be talking about, so I'm really glad it's been raised tonight. Thank you for your question. Thank I've you. got a question here, then I'm coming over here. Oh, sorry, it was in the front oh, from earlier. Uh, thank you. I'll Tom come to you, sir, soon. Tom Mellican, City of Banyul. Um, my concern about electric vehicles is they may fix one problem, but they actually add to other problems and congestion, parking, because you know, people feel they can drive them for nothing, therefore they will compete with public transport. That's my, yep. But my question is about the big build, the North East Link, mega bucks, hugely complex. We don't seem to focus on the small transport projects, and I'm talking about mm -hmm. buses. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of Melbourne's only access to public transport is buses. Yet we never talk about them, we don't invest in them, we don't make it a decent service so it doesn't attract people. Yet, for very quickly, we could roll out a much better public bus network, much more high frequency, and deliver better outcomes at a fraction of the cost in a, in a very short time period. So why don't we ever talk about buses? Yeah, happy to. Um, and I'm really glad you've raised this question yeah. because one of the things I didn't raise in my early remarks was that within the talk around the public transport, um, 
infrastructure that we're looking to support in the Victorian Greens, one of those aspects is to add 3,000 solar buses to our existing fleet and actually instigate a community consultation on where they would be best needed and when, so that they're not going to waste, so that they are able to have a really good uptake within the community as an accessible and affordable option to getting around, while also not then increasing emissions, which would then harm the environment and the climate. So I'm really glad you're raising this because absolutely buses are a crucial part of what is a, an interweaving network of public transport that we need to have in the future of Victoria. Um, so that, at the Victorian Greens level, we absolutely are pro buses <laughs> and looking to increase the capacity of buses to take people from A to B in Victoria. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree entirely with the implication of your question, also what you said, Ave. I think politicians feel that, uh, well, trains in particular are very sexy, and I love trains. Um, big tunnels are very sexy as well, and I in general, love big tunnels, um, and I like much of the North East Link, but there's so much that we can do with buses, and all the experts say it. Um, I was talking to Marion Tyrrell the other day, who's um, amazing in this space at the Grattan Institute. She's written a, recent, written a recent paper, making exactly the points that you made, about the fact that, look, look, there, there are some good mega projects underway at the moment. They've all been shockingly mismanaged, and I agree with your characterisation of, of what's gone on Ave recently as economic vandalism, but, but nonetheless, they will deliver significant benefit once completed for the state. Our bus routes and our bus timetables haven't been reviewed for decades, um, so there's so much more that could be done, also increasing frequency, um, I agree. But for some reason, for so many years in Victoria, politicians just haven't been interested in, in buses. Well, I think we've got to get interested in them. Thank you. We had a question in the middle here. Second, did you still have a question? So just wait for the microphone to come down. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to hear the support for bicycles. I was, uh, I and Alan Parker designed the principal bicycle network and I spent 10 years in the state bicycle committee and published extensively on it. As a result, I am deeply concerned that the word active transport appears to have turned into a single dimension, namely bicycles. Uh, walking is substantially important. Uh, all of the health indicators given for bicycles actually are exceeded by walking. And shared paths no longer work, partly because of the Lycra set, but partly simply because the compatibility of walkers and bicycles has reduced with the volume. Uh, even this council just left out walking in the consultation on the section of the, uh, beside the railways. There just wasn't any entry in their online system. I your, think your question, you should please. do so. The question is what are you going to do about walking? Yeah, fine. Uh, thank you. Um, like I say, I uh, worked at, uh, in Ivanhoe for many years and would either run, which normally meant spending significant periods of time walking, or ride my push bike, uh, which was just a great way to, to get around. I hear you, sir, about the manner in which some of us who ride our bikes go on on those trails, um, and I'd love to work with council and other interested residents, um, given your expertise, sir, you, um, regarding how to do better there. I certainly agree with what the Mayor said earlier about the need to uh, extend the network of paths. In Banyul, there's so much uh, natural beauty, um, and so I agree with you furiously. Um, I hear you. So oftentimes when we're talking about active transport, we, we you really hear um, bicycles, um, and bicycles are great. But given that many parts of Banyul are such interconnected communities, uh, I would have thought if you had the infrastructure in place, well, you could encourage much mode shift to walking. So I agree with you, and I'd love to talk with you more about it, given your work. Yeah, a really terrific question to have tonight in what is going to be a suite of hopefully also really excellent questions. Uh, when it comes to active transport, um, well, firstly, I'll preface by saying the Victorian Greens will have more to comment on, wink, wink, <laughs> in the weeks ahead going up to the election. But when it comes to this interaction between cyclists and pedest pedestrians going walking as their mode of transport, I think it comes down to this idea of the consultation process, and you raised it in the preamble before the question, this idea that if we are engaging with all transport users, some cyclists, some walkers, we will be able to find a middle ground where we can have access to trails and paths, where there is safety, amenity being respected of all parties involved, 
And it sounds here like that has been an imbalance and that's why we've arrived at a point where um, it sounds like the cyclists have been favoured. It's not to say that we don't have cyclists in those spaces necessarily, but that we have an improved situation from what we have now. So an improvement to those trail um, offerings, uh, as well as making sure that there are other places for the cyclists to go so that, that perhaps aren't forced to being in those spaces in the first instance. Thank you very much and thanks for your question. I had a question in here. There was up. I'll come to you next, sir, and then I'll come to the lady over the side. So thank yes. you. So I, I'm just a little confused about the North Eng East Link, where it concludes. Is it on Hoddle Street? Well, no, it connects down to the Eastern Freeway. Yeah, well, that's the same thing, isn't it? Hoddle Street. So what's, what, what are we going to do with all the increased congestion that ends up back in Hoddle Street? Well, do, do you want to go first? Uh, on that. I, I'm ready. I, if you yeah, yeah, no, no, fine, 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 fine. Thank you. And look, <laughs> so, so that's been a criticism um, that we in the Liberal Party have made from, from day one. Um, we've long said, obviously, that we think there should also be an east-west motorway. Now, you know, in previous iterations, that was branded the east-west link. Um, there was significant funding on the table from the last federal government. Indeed, the last federal government had a pledge to fully fund the government portion of that project. Uh, nine days before the federal election, the then Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Catherine King, said on the front page of the Herald Sun, so it wasn't a secret, that Labor would keep that money baked into the budget by Mr Frydenberg. Uh, I, I wrote to her on her first day as the Minister to say thank you so much, that one, that's wonderful Minister King. And then on her second day in the job, she pulled that funding for $1 billion dollars that had been set aside for Victoria. So whilst um, I think the North East Link needs to be finished, and I think it will overall have significant benefits for the broader community, notwithstanding very significant negative impacts here that I think we could do far better to mitigate, I remain very concerned about the impact on the Eastern Freeway. Yeah, um, the impact on the Eastern Freeway, this idea of congestion, when it comes to travelling on roads and increasing roads as a as a vehicle of getting a mode of getting around it is a perennial thing it will always keep coming back to this idea as soon as you add lanes eventually a matter of years go by and suddenly they're full again the reality is unless we actually really fix our current public transport system and make it a world leading system it is a matter of time until the congestion just returns again and we're having the same conversation about new freeways, about new roads. It's not to say we're not going to have any of those things. There's a, there is a degree of reality to this conversation. But I think the current position that we're in is symptomatic of not having done, it, having done enough on public transport and other modes we've talked about tonight. Thank you. I've got a question at the back. Yes. My name's Terry Barnes. So just there's a microphone to your right there. Thank I've you. I've got a very loud voice. Oh, no worries. <laughs> My name is Terry Barnes. I want to know where the uh, council's alternative proposal for the Green Lid stands at this time. In respect to well, with, our panellists? Well, with, the, with our panellists, with the government. Uh, I think the panellists can answer from their perspective. Thank you for your question. Um, Abe, would you like to go first? Yeah, for sure. So, sorry, was the question yes. position regarding the lid the link idea? Is yeah. that as, it, as, it show, as it's shown there? Okay. The left, up, yeah. Up there. I mean, speaking on the platform of Victorian Greens, we're supportive of measures that are going to mitigate damage caused by North East Link. We're not in a position that we're going to come into majority government next year. So it, it's not the reality that we're going to say yes or no that it's going to happen. However, any measure that is in place to improve what is a disastrous scheme for the area uh, is, it, look, it's a band-aid on a wound, but we'll take it. You haven't answered any questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> where's, where does it stand with the council at the moment? The Are we going ahead with that? Or are we going ahead with this? Uh, so, look, so I, I can't quite answer that one because I'm not on Banyul Council, but... Uh, this council is here. Yeah. So the, the purpose of the forum tonight is to hear from our candidates about their perspectives on local and metropolitan transport. I um, thought we're here about this. We, you are, but it's the, our panellists this evening are here to talk about their perspectives, and that's the purpose of the session tonight. But 
There is time at the end of the session tonight. There are plenty of people here from council, and there will be an opportunity for you to, well, to have a now? have a chat to those folks later on this evening. It's where it is. It's going to stay as it is. Yes, okay. Matt, can I? Sorry, folks. Can I ask Matt to respond yes, yes, to the yes. question? So, and I hear, and then, your, I hear your frustration, Terry. It would be wonderful to have a member of the government here to answer the basic oh. question. Now, if I can speak for my friends in the Labor Party, and I'm sure I can on this front, you've got no hope because uh, the government has a view that its plans are right and our, the leader of the Liberal Party, um, who's a local member of course in Bulleen, um, was very clear and very vocal after having so many local people come to his office that in his words, and excuse my language, that the government is treating so many local people, that's you, uh, like a pack of bastards. Now, um, his words, not mine, uh, but I think they were apt. Now, if if the Liberal Party wins, Terry, at uh, next month's state election, uh, we will happily consider um, this proposal, all other proposals, in order to do far better with the North East Link as part of our urgent independent audit of this project and all other projects. I'm not in a position to make a commitment tonight. I'm very worried about the shocking cost overruns, so it may not be possible to do everything that many people, including the council, would like to see done with the North East Link, but I want to look at uh, a range of, of proposals that have merit to mitigate the significant negative impacts of this project on the local community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now, I've got a, a bit of a queue for questions. So there's a lady waiting over here, then a gentleman over here, and then I'll come to the two questions here, and then I'll, I'll follow on from there. If you'll just bear with me for a second. Um, well, thank you. Actually, my questions sort have already been asked by the previous gentleman. It's I just wanted to know what the speaker's views were on that green lid and whether they would support it, but it seems like it's sort of beyond their um, abilities, really. Or They're not know, in a position I'm to be able to answer yes or to, no if it will yes, or won't go that, ahead. That's, that's right. right. Thank you. Thank you for reaffirming that question. The gentleman over here in the second row. There's a microphone behind you. Oh, is that you? Who was it? Oh, yes. Oh, so, oh we'll um, go here and then I guess I'll go here. Thank you. One, one, um, my name's Hesham Moberick. I'm representative of the Watsonia Traders Association. And we've been, we've been um, uh, engaging with North East Link for the last three years. Um, we certainly get lots of tick the box communication, but I guess I want to ask politicians, how do we how do we bring the politicians to actually really listen to the community? Because it seems to me to be an absolute no-brainer to put a lid on it to save the northern part of this project. And I can't really see any sort of commitment from, from both of you here to say it's a no-brainer to save this community, put a lid on, put, uh, put a lid on lid the link is the ideal scenario. Um, how do we bring the politicians to the table to actually properly discuss it because it's just being rejected? Was, was that me? Um, thank you so much for the question. So, so part of my response to your question, sir, would, would be this. Um, it sounds like a very good idea, by the way, right? Now, I'm interested in cost as well, as I've, as I've said. I'm also really concerned to ensure that if we're successful, uh, at next month's election, well then, I'll be the Minister for Transport Infrastructure. I'll be the responsible minister. And I'll be back regularly to talk to you, sir, and the rest of the community. Now, one of the key reasons the Auditor General says for the appalling blowouts that we've seen on um, major infrastructure projects, more than $30 billion under this government, of, of just of waste, is because projects have been um, embraced without proper processes. So I know that members of the community would love me to say tonight, well, if we win, this is what we will do. Well, no, no, what we'll do if we win is to have an independent audit, much like the audit of projects that Mr Albanese is carrying out at a federal level. I think that's a good process that he's undertaking. And then we'll seek advice from experts. This government set up Infrastructure Victoria. They need to be listened to. Um, we have Infrastructure Australia. They need to be listened to. So I think there's much merit in the scheme, but because I'm determined not to fall into the same trap that this current government has fallen into, which has delivered us so much mismanagement and waste on major projects. You're right, I'm not in a position to say yay or nay tonight, but I can absolutely give you a commitment that I'll continue coming to forums like this, coming to speak to you directly. So your, your minute is well, well up, Matt. Um, thank you, Ave. Very good. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, really, with this idea, in case it wasn't clear from my previous response, the premise behind it, the idea of improving what is a really dreadful situation is a good one. It's not a thing that, again, that I can in-person commit tonight, but it's the idea, any measure that goes to rectify, particularly on an environmental and community front, what is doing a project that's doing a lot of damage, particularly to Watsonia, um, is, a, is a good idea. We support good ideas. We wouldn't endeavour to support anything that's not a good idea. Makes common sense, right? Um, again, I think it comes back here to this idea of lack of consultation, and I mean genuine consultation, not this one-way thing we tend to see a lot at the moment. It's, they, they tell you how it's going to be rather than having a two-way flow. I think if there was more of that two-way flow of information when it comes to delivering projects of this scale, we would have a very different looking thing than what we're seeing now. Um, and, I, and I get the feeling there's a lot of people in the room tonight who, when it comes to North East Link, uh, have really been hurt either directly or indirectly by the way that it's been handled. So uh, it's really, it's a shame that Labor isn't here. Thank you. I'm going to take the question up the back, then I'll come back to you, sir. Yeah. And then I've got two in here. The one at the back? Yes, oh. in the middle. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, there's a microphone just around to your left there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank goodness for microphones. Uh, Kevin Hill from uh, Ivanhoe. Um, I hear people talk about costs, but I'm more concerned about the economic benefit and the measurement of it. Um, so in terms of cost, that's really not relevant. Uh, what is relevant is the economic return on what we spend. So could we have your perspectives and understanding of the various visions that either you or the government, current government has for the economic benefit of spending X or Y or double X or Y, including the lid. Thanks. Yes. So maybe we'll start with Abe first this time. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, for one thing, we know that any measure that's going to preserve our environment and reduce emissions is, in an economic front, a smart decision in the long term. We know if we don't address these things, there is a huge blowout financially in the long term. Beyond that, though, when it comes to investment in infrastructure, particularly public transport, particularly active modes of transport, we know that the amount you spend, you make back in spades from the capacity for community to engage at low to minimal, a very accessible cost. Uh, that has great reward for the community in the long term, if not in the immediate term. When it comes to, as I raised in a previous response before, when it comes to adding lanes, adding roads, adding freeways, we know that it's a short-term fix. We know that we're going to have to spend more in the future. And so while there can be an argument around to what degree it returns over a given period of time, we know that we are going to have to spend again. Whereas if we get our public transport sector uh, services right and really have a proactive vision to how we approach transport in that vein, we know that we are going to have better economic management when it comes to transport in Victoria. Thank you, Matt. Th thanks, Denise. Kevin, if I'm Minister of Transport Infrastructure after the election, um, I'll only invest in major projects if Infrastructure Victoria or Infrastructure Australia or other independent expert bodies demonstrate that they stack up. Now, that used to be the position of this current government. Um, it's the chief reason, for example, that I said with Matt Guy some weeks ago that if we come to government in November, we'll, we'll shelve the so-called suburban rail loop. Uh, according to independent analysis carried out by the apolitical parliamentary budget office, that project will cost uh, $120 billion just for the first two legs, just for the first two legs. Um, and according to the Auditor General, the BCR, the cost benefit ratio for that project is 0.51. Uh -huh. So you're losing 50 cents on the dollar. It's amazing. I remember when this government said the projects didn't stack up when they had a BCR of 1.4. So on, on no measure does that project stack up. And so I've copped some heat for saying that we'll shelve it. Well, I can wear that because I agree utterly with the implication of your question that, that there is rigour needed here. We're already in more debt than New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania combined. We cannot continue to waste money on projects that don't stack up. We need more and better transport infrastructure including public transport, but we can't keep wasting money on projects that don't stack up. Thank you, and thank you for your question. This gentleman in the second row, thank you. Um, firstly, I just wanted to uh, say that um, really glad that you're here and representing your um, constituents. Um, to Terry, I want to say don't lose hope. There is hope. 
we can get a lid on the link. Um, to go to the point about the, the lid itself and active transport and um, rail infrastructure, Watsonia is in need of a connection between the east and west sides and that is an intermodal transport hub. It has the capacity to support a lot of Victorian commuters, not just Watsonians, Victorian commuters if it's designed properly. In Europe, they are, um, they are no longer building freeways like the North East Link. They are putting lids on their freeways. Can I get you to freeways. ask a question, please, sir? The question is about the environmental vandalism that um, Ave spoke of. Will either of your governments condone the type of environmental vandalism that we're seeing in this day and age along Greensboro Highway that has um, resulted in the loss of significant trees and vegetation and um, the biodiversity on future projects? Thank you. Matt, would you like Was to kick me? off? Yeah, yes, uh, th thank you for the question. And no is the straightforward answer. Um, again, um, I think that across the state, there is a need for more and better transport infrastructure, and, and sometimes that will be uh, better public transport infrastructure. I've been with Matt Guy recently in uh, Baxter and over in Clyde making announcements about rail extensions, which I think are really important. I'll re soon be making some announcements about train and, and buses. I note what you've had to say, Ave, about the Greens announcements on, on buses um, as well. But on so many projects, and certainly in the North East Link, I think there were sensible mitigation measures that could have been taken, sensible measures, to protect the environment to the greatest possible extent. Now, we're creating a freeway, so it's not, it's not possible to entirely protect that environment, of course, but there are ways and ways of doing these things, especially in this community, that, that there are so many people with real expertise, the council has expertise, other experts in this room, in the broader community, and so I actually think it dovetails in really nicely with the consultation piece that has been so lacking with the North East Link. No is the short answer to your question. Thank you, Matt. Ave. Uh, well, when it comes to North East Link, the Greens have opposed it since the beginning. I know my predecessor, Samantha Dunn, was very vocally against the project. As I've raised before, the political reality is in the next term of government, whoever gets in, the project is going ahead. But as, as you've raised future projects, absolutely the Greens would not condone environmental vandalism like we've seen with this project. Thank you very much. A question, it, the, the lady in the second row, have you still got a question? At the front. Thank you. I'm uh, Michelle Jovis. I'm president of Friends of Banyul. And it's my, been my misfortune to be a member of the community liaison group for North East Link for four or five years. Um, I just want to say that the North East Link construction is, having, is harming people's health and wellbeing now due to air pollution, dust and noise far in excess of World Health Organisation noise levels and instilling a feeling, a feeling of helplessness, lack of safety and failing to engage with and inform the community what is going on. I'll get How you to ask, ask your question, please. Yeah, here it is. Thank you. How will either Liberal or Greens rein in the un unaccountable mismanagement of Big Build and ensure that the design is modified and that the um, people's well-being will be considered. Thank you. Um, Ave, are you happy to kick off? Yeah, for sure. Um, well, as, as we do frequently with this current government, the Greens being a non-majority party in this current political climate, we seek to hold the government to account every instance that we can, including on Big Build, particularly on Big Build, projects like North East Link, tough questions need to be asked. And I do thank you for the work that you've done for the community for, for years in really chasing them down on this. They, as we see tonight, lack accountability, lack transparency, lack genuine consultation when it comes to delivery of some of these massive projects that do a lot of both environmental and economic damage. Um, when it comes to the Greens, every step of the way, irrespective of who is in government, would seek to pursue genuine com community consultation, protection of environment, genuine projects that, that support local amenity and need. We, we, when it comes to roads, as we've raised earlier, if there's no need for it, why would you ever do it? It's not just an election winning point. The idea is we wanna have infrastructure that actually services community need. 
Thanks, Michelle. A range of community groups have spoken to me about exactly the point you make, um, a lack of proper mitigation measures that then mean that construction is having an undue impact on the health and wellbeing of, of local residents. Now, I've, I've raised this matter in Parliament. I've asked questions of Minister Allen. Um, uh, I might get her responses that are on the record to those questions and share them with you, Michelle. Um, I wasn't fully pleased with them, but I'm happy to share them with you and certainly the commitment that I made in Parliament, so it's on the record and you must hold me to it if we win government next month, is that all of these matters will be really thoroughly considered as part of the independent audit that we're going to carry out of the North East Link project. Thank you. I'm just going to just check on, do a check on questions. I know this gentleman's got one, then up the back, and then the lady at the back, and then I'll, I'll need to come to who's next, if that's okay. Hold off. I will come to you, um, so, and I'll come back to you, sir. I'll give other people an opportunity first. If you could please um, take the microphone behind your right there. Thank you. Good evening. My name is uh, Gerard Vander, and I'm just a concerned citizen. 20, 20 years ago, we were talking about a transport hub which was going to be just, just right here. Uh, so far, nothing has happened. Uh, we've got the, our new Greensboro station. Uh, I suggested that we have an overpass so people do not have, or so they a, can walk to the transport hub in safety and have accessibility. And we don't have 10 bus lines parking in, in uh, five different locations within this surround. Uh, question, two questions actually, a little one, a uh, sub-question. Just one question first and we'll, we'll come back to you. Right. Second question after Are you that. aware of it? Uh, so, yes, uh, sir, I've heard of these issues and I think just it's a very quick response. To me, this is part of a, a dreadful lack of planning over a long period of time. Right. One of the chief reasons why we need an integrated transport plan is to deal with some of the concerns that, that you've expressed. April love it because there's no environmental uh, impact on it. And Ave, your response? Yeah, I mean, for, for the first part, whether or not I'm aware of it, if it was 20 years ago, I was seven years old, so probably not at that stage. Um, when it comes to the idea that you're raising, though, as we know, transport needs to be accessible, affordable, uh, and do the right thing for the planet that we live on. So from what it sounds like you're describing, yeah, it's something we need to pursue. Uh, and it's a shame that it hasn't been delivered already. Thank you. Thank you. You've got a question at the back there. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Trudy. I'm a resident in Yarrambat and um, you might be wondering why I'm asking that question. Just like the gentleman was talking about with Hoddle Street, um, we on Yan Yan Road have, uh, especially stage two, it's stalled. We've heard nothing, the local residents have heard nothing and we are going to be feeding the North East Link and the North East Link is going to be feeding us. And right now, it looks like it did 30 years ago, it's crumbling. Um, so my question is, um, can you please shed some light on why this is stalled last year and why, they will, why the dates are missing and disappearing off websites and why they refuse to give me a new start date? <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, no is the short answer. Um, uh, um, numerous uh, of our candidates actually have recently been speaking with me about the specific issue of Yanreen Road. Um, I don't know why you haven't received any answers to your questions. I also don't know why initial works then stalled because I agree with you that this is a critical piece of infrastructure, especially as we move ahead with the North East Link. Um, now, um, I was talking to Danny O'Brien a little earlier today. He's the uh, Shadow Minister for uh, Public Transport and Roads, so I work very closely with him, and he'll have more to say um, about a variety of road projects over the next few weeks, so please watch that space because some of them will have a direct bearing on um, Banyul. Um, more broadly, uh, many of our roads, I including in our part of the world, um, have been allowed to fall into disrepair and are in need of upgrades. That's why we announced a $10 billion roads package uh, a couple of weeks ago. But there are particular issues with Yanyi Road and I I'm sorry, I can't answer those questions. Mm. Thank you, Ave. Your, your response? Yeah. Uh, well, as we know, the infrastructure that we have, including roads, it is incumbent on whoever is in government to maintain them and so it sounds like that has not happened in this instance. In terms of where it's at, 
I wish Labor were here to answer that. It's quite shameful that they're not and that no one could be here to be recipient of this question. Um, as I've just raised though a sentence prior, um, with the Greens or anyone else we'd seek to see in government, it's incumbent on anyone in that position to maintain the infrastructure that we have. And if that's not happening, it's a real community concern. And as was raised also earlier, lack of accountability and lack of genuine consultation that you can't get the answers you're looking for. I had a question at the back, the lady at the back, and then to the gentleman in front. So thanks for your patience. Thank you. Um, Daniel Andrews has been telling us all year that Melbourne's going to be a mega city. So he's talked first of all about eight million, then he's talked about nine million, and more recently, 11 point something million. Um, and I guess all these transport projects are to facilitate Melbourne being a mega city for both freight and for movement. So the train line, the circular train line, they've proposed that every 1.6 kilometres mm. either side of that will be available for high rise and the Town and Country Planning Association has figured that that would be enough to put 32 Melbourne CBDs mm. in those areas and that comes to Heidelberg. Mm. Um, I'd like to know that your party's attitude on Melbourne being a mega city and whether we really have to be a mega city and have these transport projects. Thank you. Mm. Um, Ave, you happy to kick off first? Yeah, for Thank sure. You. Uh, approaching it, whether or not we want to be a mega city, I think to step back, the reality is that we are a growing population, and so it's important that our infrastructure and that our projects support that, that population. It is important that there is an evidence base to those decisions being made, so that if we know for a fact that there is a community there that we need to service, that we service them, we make sure there is infrastructure in place to support them. But then in terms of future planning, also acknowledging and having a think about what is the future Victoria that we want to see? Do we want certain areas to be incredibly built up? What does that look like? What would transport, particularly given tonight's conversation, look like? I know there are some parts of Melbourne where they have the benefit of having trams that helps them a lot. When we look at places like Heidelberg, what does the future of Heidelberg look like? It's Existentially, from whoever is in government, it is a really, really big issue that we think about what the growth of this state is, because it is going to grow, irrespective of who forms government. Uh, and so the Greens will always look to make sure that we have what is an evidence-based focus on those projects on any front, and that we also consider the environmental impact in delivering those, those schemes to service the community. Mm. Thank you so much for the question. So I oppose the government's approach. You raised um, the suburban rail loop and the um, huge development and population growth that will be facilitated by that project in, in certain areas. Now, in Parliament, the Liberals and Nationals sought to amend the initial Suburban Rail Loop Act to take out those provisions that, you, you're right, will, will enable, if the government wins in November, because if they win, they will go ahead with this project, um, just, just open slather. Now, in this part of the world where I used to work and where my wife grew up, um, we love the fact that there is low density and, and that shouldn't be for changing. Um, there are other parts of, of the city where you could sensibly have increased density. Um, we also know that the way the city has evolved is to move further out. You know, my brother lives in Officer, miles out. Um, that's one of the reasons why Matt Guy and I have been announcing rail extensions, because something this government has failed to do is to enable people who are living really quite far out from the city to have access to good public transport. So I think there are sensible ways of managing inevitable growth not exponential growth, but, but inevitable growth, and certainly the way that's proposed through the suburban rail loop is, is not one I support one bit. Thank you. The gentleman, uh, yes, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, David Mulholland, Ivanhoe resident. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate both Matt, Matthew and uh, Abe for turning up tonight and facing the community. Um, my project is a smaller one. But, and I think the Mayor actually mentioned it in her intro, it's a so-called pedestrian bridge, and I use that word uh, lightly, uh, that crosses from one side of Ivanhoe Station to the other side of Ivanhoe Station. Mm. Why I said it's not really a pedestrian bridge is that uh, disabled people can't use it, a mother with a pram can't use it, older people can't use it. I, I reckon if we were talking benefit-cost ratios, it would be in the tens to twenties. Um, if I, I could said, ask you to move to your question yeah, the soon. Question is, the question is, um, would either, 
either party support um, a disabled friendly uh, access at Ivano Station instead of a 100 year old pedestrian bridge? Thank you. So I keep on losing track of who's, always, who's turning. I'm, I'm yeah. mixing it up. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, no, no. no, no Keeping some edge. Um, the accessible option sounds great. Uh, it sounds silly to knock the idea. Why not have more accessibility to Ivanhoe Station? And yes is the answer from me too, David. Um, I used to teach at Ivanhoe Girls just up the road from Ivanhoe Station, so I know that bridge, as you call it, um, very well. Um, and of course, it's not accessible at all. Um, it's actually written into federal law that uh, our train stations have to be accessible. Um, and yet, so many, so many are not. So I've been out with the Liberal candidate for Ivanhoe, Bernadette Curie at, at Heidelberg Station, um, where significant changes need to be made to make that station accessible, especially given it's right near such an outstanding medical precinct. Uh, the same needs to happen at Ivanhoe Station. Now we've got 10 minutes remaining and I've got hands up from people who have already asked a question. So I will, uh, sorry, the gentleman at the back, then I'll come to you, sir, and then you, sir, and then you at the back. And then I think that if we get, we maybe come to you next because other people have had a chance to ask a question. At the back, thank you. Hi, um, my name's Paul Spain. We're new residents in Montmorency. Um, my question, it, it, follows on from something you said, Matt, earlier about um, the Liberals have announced uh, 10 billion road, 10 billion into a, a roads funding package. I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm hearing lots of good words tonight and I think the, the audit into uh, spending is good, but I'm just wondering if you're actually going to have a package, an announced package regarding public transport going into this election. So what... To spending. Oh, so now was it Paul, sorry? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So what we've done, Paul, with our public transport announcements is to make them in a sequence. So the short answer to your question is no, we haven't announced our full public transport package yet. There'll be far more to come, but that will all be on the table well in advance of the election for you to see that. So, so far, sir, what we've done is to announce uh, an important extension to Baxter, from Frankston to Baxter. Population growth is significant in that region. Uh, we've announced an extension to Clyde, again, through a very significant growth corridor. Um, I've already had some strong things to say about the Western Rail Plan, um, which the government promised many moons ago. And, you know, the poor punters out, out in the Western suburbs who have to chug into town on a V-line um, when the government promised them electrification many, many years ago. So the, the basic premise of our plan, sir, is, is to seek to extend the current network to deliver the maximum bang for buck, always in line with the recommendations of expert bodies like Infrastructure Victoria, um, because that's something that we can do despite a whole range of global factors that we haven't spoken about tonight that will make complex work like tunnelling increasingly expensive in the future. We can, however, lay track, extend train lines, extend tram lines, and those are things that Infrastructure Victoria in particular says give you real bang for buck. Thank you. Yeah, um, when it comes to public transport, the Greens have already announced several really quite ambitious, quite significant policy points, and so if, if I haven't covered enough of them tonight. I'm sure I haven't. They're quite, they're quite vast <laughs> and detailed. Um, looking on the Vic Greens website, there's plenty to go through in terms of costing as well as benefit and delivery. Um, there, again, is still more to come. I, I mentioned earlier we are going to be talking a bit more about active transport, but it, transport, in particularly given its environmental impact and its impact on climate, means that we will continue to talk about it, particularly in the weeks leading up to the election. Thank you. I'll go to the question at the back over here. Thank you. Hi. It's probably more of a values-based question. My intention is to ensure that young families and kids have access to the local library and services in Watsonia. We have to cross the North Link by bike. We want it safe and green. It's good stuff. It's more for Matt. What will you do if you're elected to ensure that community-first initiatives like put the lid on it state as key non-negotiable outcomes regardless and separate to the outcome of the independent investigation, because I don't want a party in power that may cut cost on community outcomes for projects which are already in flight. Yeah, no, no thank you. Great question, um, too. I appreciate that. Um, the, the, the sort of measures that you're talking about um, are measures I know that, in particular, Infrastructure Victoria are really passionate about. I spoke to Jonathan Spear, the CEO of Infrastructure Victoria, just last week. They have much expertise there, and in their 30-year plan, which is, which is a great document, and it's from that plan, quite frankly, that we've taken each one of our public transport announcements um, that are also recommended by other um, 
expert bodies. And so um, I hear you. I think it is really important, especially when you're embarking on very significant projects, to be really clear at the outset about the potential for that project to, to stack up. Um, I've got a four-year-old um, and a um, five-month-old, and we spend a huge amount of time at the library, and so I hear you. Those things are really important. Um, so um, given the expertise that we have in Infrastructure Victoria in particular, um, and given our commitments, my public commitments on any number of occasions to make sure that we work really closely with Infrastructure Victoria, you'll be able to hold me to that if we get in and then I do something different. Well, from the Greens' perspective, our door is always open. Our position, again, as a non-majority party is that we hold whoever forms government to account. We raise the issues. So coming to us means that we have a direct vehicle to hold them to it in Parliament. Um, in the significant likelihood that Greens come back into um, having a seat at the North East Metro level like we historically have in the past, um, the reality is that by bringing it forward, we can continue to ask the tough questions. The reality is, I mean, we're seeing an absence of Labor here tonight. Sometimes going to them doesn't give you the answer that you want. Sometimes you do need to go to an outside voice and have them really advocate on your behalf. And seeking a diversity of views to, to get that advocacy, to make sure that you have access to your local facilities like the library. Did you have another yeah. question, sir? Thank you. And then I'll, I'll come up to the back there. Thank you. I've been concerned for if some time, time that the badge of honour Mr Dan Andrews has with building these flyovers is so costly. He's put it up to 80 he wants to do. I believe there's another 30 to do. And what I'm concerned about, that money could be better put into roads and making sure the structure um, around our area and other areas where the roads are in a shocking state. What sort of case study is done to justify suddenly saying 80 flyovers have got to be done and uh, with another 30 I don't know what the cost of those things are but they must be huge the massive infrastructures so I would rather see safe roads for the commuters around here and other places instead of big potholes everywhere you go so what's your position on that would you be able to hold back some of those uh, things that are probably un uh, su su supported or are, are not essential right now because we're in debt, can't we hold back on some of those things and look after local services? Thank you. There's a couple of questions in there. Abe, are you happy to I'll try and uh, with attempt them. a response to that? Thank um, you. Yeah, I mean, really, the, the points raised there, I think, come down to what would be sound economic management. The, you can't let things fall by the wayside on any given front. The reality is to do the right job of whoever forms government is to make sure that we are maintaining what needs to be maintained. Um, making sure that we have an evidence basis to the expenditure of, of funds. And it sounds like in the detail you're describing, I mean, I can't, I can't speak to the mindset of the Labor Party and why they're doing what they're doing, but I would sure hope that if they're putting something in place and trying to deliver it, that there would be a reason for doing that. Again, can't speak as to the scenario. From the Greens' perspective, we will always ask the tough questions. Why is it being spent? In t rationale in terms of forming a budget, like when you have to divvy up how much goes in what direction, making sure that there is some accountability on the decisions that are made. Um, this is what you can expect from Vic Victorian Greens. Thank you. I, oh, sorry, would you mind if I quickly respond to that question as well? Yes, of course. Th thanks so much. <laughs> um, I worry about the, the lack of process at the moment to determine which level crossings are removed and where. So Vic Roads has a list. So Vic Roads has a list. Um, and um, I respect Vic Roads. I respect the views of the Grattan Institute. We've spoken about um, um, Infrastructure Victoria, um, a whole range of other, other bodies. Now, I think there are a series of, of level crossings that are important to remove. So I fully support the level crossing removal program. I was with Jason uh, in his electorate in Eltham just recently making an announcement. But you'll see over coming weeks that where the government has made some commitments in this election campaign already, for example, the government announced, I shouldn't laugh, nine level crossing removals in the seat of Brunswick. Now, if I was a cynic, I would say that many of those were due to the fact that the Labor Party is fighting the Greens, obviously, in the seat of Brunswick, it may not necessarily be that there is demonstrated need. Each of these level crossing removals costs about $250 million. So I, I very much support the ongoing removal of level crossings, but we need to be able to walk and chew gum. We need to listen to the experts as well. Roads is a critical priority. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt, and sorry for my eagerness to get no, another no, no, question fine. in the room. 
I'll go to the gentleman up the back, and I think we'll we'll take that as the last question. There's a couple more that um, people had, but you've had an, an opportunity, and there will be time after for a chat after the session. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so with the rail extension that you talked about earlier, um, Matt, as well as obviously with the need to have more um, public transport with a 10 minute service that you talked about, Avi, obviously we have a rail extension project going on right now to duplicate to Eltham. And we all know that that's kind of failed and it's stopping halfway. And as a consequence, we can't get the 10 minute service to Eltham. We can't get any of the Greensboro trains extended out to Eltham. So the question I would have for both of you is, um, do you have any views on how we can fix the mess of, of the project whilst respecting the environment because the environment as well has been quite excessively damaged beyond what the scope of the original project was as well? Yes, yes. Uh, now it's my turn. Isn't it, Denise? Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes. So that's right. I'm concerned too about the environmental impacts of that project. In my discussions with Jonathan Spear and others, um, there's, a, there's a view among some expert bodies that um, given population density that that particular project, which, which I know is a real priority for many people in this room, um, is not as important as some other projects. So I haven't at this stage made an announcement about carrying on in the short term with that project. But like I say, I'm very interested in it and I've had a number of conversations with expert bodies. I, I, I don't doubt that in the future it will be necessary, um, but um, I have thought, obviously I dare say, given I've made some other announcements with Matt Guy already in this election campaign, that there have been some even higher priorities. It's one we're going to have to watch very closely and as we move forward with it at some stage in the future, working with the local community to mitigate those significant environmental impacts is also going to be important. Thank you, Abe. Yeah, as, as an Eltham resident, I feel like I've heard about this issue forever, <laughs> pretty much. Um, uh, when it comes to the project itself, I, I, my understanding of where it's currently at, it, it again comes back to this idea of um, lack of accountability and engagement with the community in a genuine way and what we want that to look like, what we want the outcome to be. The reality is if we, if we want to have um, increased frequency of services, then measures will have to be taken to make sure that the infrastructure is up to scratch to support that. But from the environmental standpoint, my understanding of where it sort of ended up however long ago was that the appropriate um, surveying was not undertaken, this appropriate consultation on the environmental footprint, let alone everything else, did not take place. And that is why, again, now we're in a position where there's question marks around what is going on with this project, that if it's not electorally opportune, why do we suddenly hear nothing about it? And why do we have no Labor person here tonight to speak to it? Thank you very much. We do want to allow time for our panellists to provide some closing remarks. So that's all we have time for in terms of questions. But thank you very much, everyone, for your questions. Um, so I'll now invite, in reverse order, um, Ave Puglielli, if you're happy to take the podium yeah, for your final sure. remarks. I believe you have two minutes. Um, and then we'll invite Matt to do the same. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming along tonight. It, it can sometimes be a, a bit wild and woolly coming in, battling the elements to come in and speak to, to those of us that turn up to answer the questions, the tough questions, really good questions, I'll point out. Um, the reality is, as I've said, irrespective of who forms government, we've got these big transport projects being rolled out, being delivered, new ones that will eventually come, I'm sure. And in each instance, it's really important that we factor in what are the environmental um, impacts of those projects. Are they consultative with the community? And genuine consultation, when I say that, as I've raised elsewhere tonight, is it a genuine two-way passage of information where you have an impact on what the delivered project is? Or is it just them telling you, this is what we're going to deliver, hope you like it? The reality, as I've outlined um, earlier, is that we need to be making sure that every um, delivered piece of infrastructure that we get on transport is based on evidence, is based on a vision of what we want Victoria to look like that is friendly towards its climate, is, is responsive to the land that we're living on and paying respect to, not just ripping scars through it like we're seeing with North East Link. And I do thank, particularly on the topic of North East Link, all the people that came along tonight to speak to the issue. It's quite shameful that you haven't been listened to at all with your concerns currently. And I really, I'm quite saddened to see no Labor member here to speak. It, not that necessarily they wouldn't have something good to say, but the fact that they haven't turned up, I think is really quite sad for the community that have come along tonight. And I hope you honestly remember this at the ballot box. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you.
And thank you. We invite uh, final speaker Matt Buck to uh, address you with your final remarks. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Denise. And a huge thank you again to um, MTF for putting on this forum and so many other forums around the state. Uh, I'd echo your sentiments, Ave. I think one of the reasons why it is so important to really prioritise engaging with local communities is because the needs of local communities around our state are often quite disparate. So I hear, when I talk to community groups here in Banyul, far more about active transport, for example, far more about the sort of measures, sir, that you spoke about as well, than in some other communities where there is a view that, that greater density um, could work and there is a need for different forms of infrastructure. Um, now, like I say, I'm, I'm lucky that I used to work in this community and my wife used to live in this community, but of course there are so many other parts of the state where I come into these discussions with so little knowledge and I think it would be the height of arrogance to think that I would have uh, all of the answers. So thank you so much for your engagement tonight. I look forward to continuing um, the conversation. Of course, a very large part of the conversation is the North East Link, but there are numerous other priorities that need to be considered and progressed as well, um, especially in, in this community. And my commitment to you in particular, and it may not sound particularly sexy, is that if we win, well then having an integrated transport plan with much input from the community, but also expert bodies, um, is something that we will commit to. Having that independent audit, moving ahead with major projects like the North East Link, yes, but nonetheless having an urgent and independent audit to seek to reduce waste, that's very important to me, but deliver the very best outcomes for local communities after genuinely listening is something also that I and those in my party think is, is really, uh, really important. So thank you for all your great questions tonight for your engagement. So can I please invite you all to thank our panellists this evening? So that wraps up the formal um, proceedings for the event tonight. Um, on behalf of MTF and Banyul City Council, I would like to thank um, you all for coming and also to thank those for behind the scenes who've put this event on tonight. It's a miserable night, um, so thank you for taking the time out of your evenings to come along um, and for asking your questions. Um, I'd like to ask you to stay. Um, if you've got, there were a couple of questions we didn't get through, so hopefully you get to ask the panelists directly or have a chat to some of the folk here from council. Um, please stay and have a cuppa and a chat with each other. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along. Who, who is the, who is the